So this is uh, this is another talk about the scan meta GGA. Uh, here I might call it a sales talk. In a way. Uh, I do want to sell sell the product, so I have to advise you of that in advance. Uh, <clears throat> So I call it scan meta GGA, the predictive power of 17 exact constraints. So I'll start with my conclusion. Uh, can we get the right answer for the right reason at the right price? I, I, uh, we don't have it yet, but we're getting closer, and I think this is not an impossible dream. And I think SCAN brings us a lot closer to that, the realization of that dream. Uh, so, so before I get into discussion of SCAN, I want to go back to uh, an interesting, interesting statements that Kieran made yesterday about the Lieb-Simon theorem, uh, which says that there's a certain scaling limit for systems build up from uh, nuclei and electrons. The scaling limit uh, a kind of uh, limit of large nuclear charge, for instance, for an atom, a neutral atom, in which the semi-local functionals become exact. And uh, <clears throat> you might be tempted to conclude from that that there's something special about the Coulomb interaction, the, the external potential uh, that attracts the electrons to the nuclei. Uh, but you shouldn't conclude that. Uh, the semi-local functionals work just as well for harmonic oscillator external potentials or for pseudo-potentials as they work for, uh, for uh, Coulomb, Coulomb external potentials. Um, and Kieran, Kieran agrees with that. And, and in fact, this morning he explained to me that the 800 pages of the Lieb-Simon proof was basically to prove the theorem for the Coulomb potential because that was the hardest case to prove. That was a challenging case to prove. Uh, so semi-local functionals, spin density functionals work well whenever the exact exchange correlation hole is localized around the electron and determined by the spin density in the vicinity of the electron. Uh, and that uh, situation includes, but it's not limited to, atoms, compact molecules, solids, uh, it doesn't apply to stretched molecules where we see strong correlation effects that are, uh, can't possibly be captured by semi-local functionals because in those cases the exact exchange correlation hole itself can be delocalized over two centers. Uh, atoms, in, in an atom the exact exchange correlation hole is very well localized and that means that atoms can actually serve as appropriate norms for the construction of meta-GGAs. Uh, and specifically what that means is that the exchange energy alone can be very accurate for every atom in the periodic table, and the correlation alone can be very accurate for every, every element in the periodic table. Okay, so, so I'm going to go back and review the approach that I discussed in three lectures uh, on the LDA, the GGA, and the meta-GGA. Uh, how can we approximate the density functional for the exchange correlation energy? Um, you'll often hear people say there's no systematic way to construct uh, a density functional approximation. That's true in one sense. Uh, there's no mechanistic way to do it. It's not like, you know, uh, perturbation theory is a sort of mechanistic approach. Uh, you, can, you can systematically build up the answer. Um, and the construction of density functional doesn't work quite that way. But there is, there is a, a, an approach you can take which is uh, about as systematic as, as you can be at present. And that is uh, uh, what I call the physics way that produces predictive or uh, extrapolative functions. Uh, there's also a competing way, which we haven't heard very much about at this meeting. Uh, I call it the fitting way, with, and I spell that with a PHY, because there is some physics behind it, typically in the form that is being fitted. Uh, and then one introduces para uh, parameters that are fitted to experiment. 
if you only use a, a if, you, if you choose a, a your form carefully and you have just a few parameters, you can build up a good functional this way too. Uh, but uh, if you if you have a very flexible form and you and, and you use 40 parameters or something, uh, you'll be producing what I would call an interpolative functional. That's a functional that interpolates uh, uh, in a data set, the data set to which it was fitted. And it could be very accurate in that data set and for similar, uh, si similar systems and properties to the ones to which it was fitted. Uh, but if you, if you fit, and particularly if you fit things that should not be fit, you'll be getting the right answer in a limited domain for the wrong reason. Uh, an example of that would be, for instance, if you take uh, a meta GGA and you uh, and you have a lot of parameters and, and you fit to experimental energy barriers for uh, chemical reactions. Well, as Kieran said and as White House said uh, uh, yesterday, the energy barrier is, uh, typically involves a large self-interaction error. The semi-local functionals can eliminate uh, enough of that self-interaction error. So you can make a fitted functional that gives accurate barriers by forcing it, but then something, if you force it in that direction, something else will go wrong someplace else. And I could talk about that, but I won't talk about it today. So here are the, the five steps to uh, constructing a uh, physics-based density functional approximation. Uh, the the uh, the first step is to prove the existence of the exact density functional. So that's been done for us by Hohenberg and Cohn, Cohn and Sham. And uh, derive some exact formal expression for it, which is not, compu uh, not computationally useful perhaps, but is mathematically useful for the derivation of properties. The example would be the constrained search, right? Constrained search. Doesn't it is not a way to do a calculation. It's a way to derive the exact properties of the function. Then uh, you uh, you do that. So you discover the mathematical properties of the exact functional, which I'll call the exact constraints, including limits, scaling relations, inequalities, bounds, and so on. Uh, a lot of that work was done in the 1980s. Uh, more could be done. I don't think we know all the exact constraints. Um, it would be useful to know more. Uh, the third step is you develop some approximate but computationally tractable forms that have increasing levels of flexibility. And you do that by adding ingredients to the functional, from the density to the gradient of the density to the uh, orbital kinetic energy density or exact exchange ingredients. Um, then, uh, then you can uh, impose the exact constraints from step three onto a given form as appropriate. And if a form retains some flexibility, and typically the meta GGA form is a, we have a function of three arguments. That's a, that, that's a, a big space already, a function of three arguments. And so, the, so even when you fit all the exact constraints, some flexibility will remain and you can introduce additional appropriate norms. The first appropriate norm is the uniform electron gas, but you could, for instance, use atoms uh, or maybe atoms of large, uh, large, uh, uh, large atomic number uh, to, uh, to provide additional appropriate norms to determine the, the functional. Um, so, so sometimes people ask, you know, which which constraints are most important? And I can't really, can't really answer that because they're all important. Uh, when you construct the functional from the constraints, the constraints become entangled in the functional. The functional is not just a linear combination of constraints. It's a highly nonlinear combination of the constraints. Constraints shape the functional, and the functional shapes the answer. The more constraints you have, the better on the functional. And so I would say that all exact constraints are created equal and endowed by their creator with the right to be satisfied. So now I'm going to talk about specifically about the scan functional, which is a product of these five steps. 
Uh, Scan comes from uh, uh, comes from our group at Temple, uh, John Way's son, who was my student uh, at Tulane and then my postdoc and, and research assistant professor at Temple for a while. Uh, Adrian Rzinski, who's here, and I, uh, we, we published this 2015 physical review letter about SCAN. Um, John Way deserves a lot of credit. John Way, uh, John Way worked very hard on this. I think he believed in these five steps. And uh, to actually implement them is a lot is a lot harder than to write them down. Okay, uh, so he spent years working uh, uh, ways of actually satisfying uh, the 17 exact constraints that the, 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 the meta GGA can satisfy, and then more uh, more time uh, testing the functional that, that uh, came out. But it worked well for him. He got a, a tenure track faculty job. And he's now at the, the uh, University of Texas at El Paso. So what are the 17 exact constraints that are satisfied by the scan function? Uh, I'm going to list them here. First, I'll list the constraints for exchange of the exchange energy alone, then for the correlation of the energy alone, and then for the, the two combined into one object, EHC. And, uh, I'll put an asterisk in front of the ones that are also satisfied by PVE. So 11 of the 17 were also satisfied by the Purdue Burke Energy Hall generalized gradient approximation. Some of these constraints are very simple and trivial. Others are very, uh, others require very sophisticated proof. But I'll list them all. So for exchange, the first exact constraint is negativity. Exchange energy has to be negative. Uh, then there's a spin scaling equality, which tells you that if you know the exchange energy for a spin unpolarized density, you can use that to construct the, the exchange energy for any spin polarized density exactly. I mean, in the same way that the exact functional does. Uh, the third one is uniform density scaling. Uh, Mel spent a lot of time explaining the uniform density scaling and how the exchange energy scales when you scale the density. Then there's the, the fourth order gradient expansion for the exchange energy around the uniform density. Uh, it's actually known to fourth order, and uh, we can recover that in the slowly varying limit. Uh, the fifth one is uh, the finite non-uniform scaling limit. Uh, this is where we scale just one coordinate or two coordinates instead of all three, uh, x, y, and z. And, um, you can also satisfy that one. Uh, and uh, finally, we know a, a tight lower bound for the, two, the, the exchange energy of a two electron density uh, that comes partly from Elliott Lieb and partly from our group. <coughs> and for correlation, uh, non positivity, the correlation energy can be zero, but it can't be positive. Uh, we know the second order gradient expansion for correlation, not the fourth order, but the second order. Uh, the uniform scaling uh, to the, of correlation energy to the high density limit and to the low density limit are listed here. Uh, we can use the meta GGA to zero out the correlation energy for all one electron densities. We do. Uh, and finally, there's a finite non-uniform scaling limit for correlation. What these non-uniform scaling limits are like is you start with a, imagine starting with a, with a density, let's say it's a spherical density, and then maybe you could, you, you could do a one-dimensional scaling and you could collapse the sphere into a pancake. And then you're going from a three-dimensional system to a two-dimensional system. The exchange energy per particle and the correlation energy per particle have to remain finite when that happens. And finally, for both together, Size extensivity, that just means that the total energy of separated pieces has to be equal to the sum of the energies of the pieces. It's a sort of trivial one. Uh, there's a, a general Lebox-Oxford lower bound on the exchange correlation energy for any density. Uh, the weak uh, spin polarization dependence of the exchange correlation energy in the low density limit, which is a strongly correlated limit where the spins never 
get close. One spin never gets close to another. Uh, there's the static linear response of the uniform gas, and finally there's a Lebox-Oxford bound for exchanging correlation <laughs> together for two electron densities. Okay, so those are those are all 17 constraints. Uh, okay, so so uh, briefly because because you saw this before, the meta GGA. Uh, exchange correlation energy is a single integral over three-dimensional space of a function and, it, and since we're doing spin density functional theory it's actually a function of six variables. The up and down spin electron density we're doing co uh, what, what uh, Barty calls uh, collinear spin density functional theory. Uh, we have the gradients of the up and down spin densities and the orbital kinetic energy densities for spin up and spin down. Uh, and uh, the role of tau is basically that it has simple and useful limits. Uh, the exact tau is constructed from the occupied Kuhn-Sham orbitals, from the squares of the gradients of the occupied orbitals. If you look, if you have a single orbital shape, like a one electron or two electron ground state, tau is tau Weisinger. It just simplifies to one eighth del n squared over n. We have a uniform electron gas that goes like n to the five thirds. So we can construct this dimensionless ingredient alpha, which Adrian talked about and which I talked about yesterday. It's tau minus tau Weisinger over tau uniform. It's basically an ingredient of what Beckett called the electron localization function. So it's not a new, it's not a new object, but but. Uh, we realize that it's a good object for the construction of meta GTAs because it can recognize three different kinds of bonds. Uh, if we have a single uh, a single orbital shape, or if we have a covalent bond which has essentially one orbital shape, uh, tau is tau Weisinger and alpha is zero. If we have a slowly varying density, like in a simple metal, alpha is roughly one. And if we have an overlap of closed shells, like two argon atoms coming close together. We have alpha much bigger than one, and that's that's a kind of, uh, uh, that's the region where you can have a non-covalent bond, like a, a hydrogen bond or, or typically an intermediate range of minerals. So we can recognize three kinds of bonding, and we can give the appropriate GGA description to each one. Uh, and, and, and here are some of the results. Okay, I'm not going to show you the form of scan because it's a, as Karen said, you can get, it would take a page to write it down. Uh, I, and instead of doing that, I'm going to show you some numerical results. You can find the formula, of course, in the, in the, in the paper. So here are some very early results for molecules and solids. I'm going to compare just the the Purdue Burke Ernzer Hall GGA performance to the scan meta GGA performance. Uh, using the mean absolute errors in different properties for different systems. So I'll start with this G3 data set where the energy errors are measured in kilocalories per mole. Uh, kilocalorie per mole is about 400 of an electron volt. Uh, and this G3 set is for the atomization energies of 223 molecules. It's a standard test set in chemistry. Uh, the PB error is 22. The scan error is, is 6. So almost a factor of 4 uh, reduction of the error. Uh, the next one here is the uh, BH76. That's the barrier heights for seven, uh, 76 barrier heights to chemical reactions. Here, you see scan is only slightly better than PBE. It's not a factor of four, it's more like 15% or something. But that's what we expect because, uh, you know, here uh, I was pointing out that, that when you calculate energy barriers, the, uh, there's, a, there's a density driven error that associated with all semi-local functionals. You cannot eliminate that with a semi-local functional. Uh, this S22 set is a set of uh, 22 uh, bonded closed shell systems, typically one closed shell molecule binding to another through 
a hydrogen bond or van hydrogen bonds or van der Waals bonds or both. Uh, there, the uh, PB error is three and the scan error is one. That's a factor of three improvement. Um, to get away from molecules to solids, here the LC20 set is a set of lattice constants for 20 solids. Uh, and the errors here are measured in angstroms. Uh, so the PB error is 0.06, the scan error is 0.016, that's again a factor of uh, about three, three or four. Those were the very first tests we did, and I thought they, they seemed promising. Uh, now, I showed you that, 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 that uh, uh, scan app performs PVE for the weak bonds. The PVE GJ includes very little uh, intermediate range van der Waals interaction. The scan functional includes more. It can actually recognize this large alpha region in which the intermediate range van der Waals interaction happens. And as a result, scan can work well for soft matter as well as hard matter. Soft matter uh, includes water, liquid water, and I'll say something about that later. Uh, now, an important point to notice is that although SCAN has some appropriate norms, it is fitted to some appropriate norms. It's not fitted to any bonded system. It's not fitted to any molecule. It's not fitted to any solid around equilibrium. And uh, so whatever prediction SCAN makes for bonds, they're genuine predictions. They're not interpolation between uh, between known results. So let me give you some solid state results. Uh, let's look at silic, solid silicon. Uh, th this is the situation before scan. So before scan, basically, the only, uh, the only functional that could deal with, with the two problems I'm showing on this slide was the, the uh, hybrid functional. Uh, so the first problem is the structural phase transition of silicon under pressure. Low pressure phase is diamond, semiconducting phase, high pressure phase, beta tin, a metallic phase. <laughs> we can uh, we can look at the pressure or the energy change in this transition. Here I'm looking at the energy difference between the two phases, measured in milli electron volts per atom. Uh, the best result here is diffusion by Carlo, that's this yellow bar with a little uncertainty indicated by the gray. Uh, the hybrid functional is doing very well compared to diffusion by Carlo, but look at what all the semi-local functions we're doing. LDA was too low by almost a factor of two. The, the early GJ and PW91 did better, the PB is a little worse. Then, then our meta GJ TPSS from um, uh, about 10 years ago, even, even worse. So that's, kind of, that's, that's, in a sense, is what motivated us to look for SCAN. And we saw these results, uh, which came, came from work of uh, we, uh, we felt we have to make a better meta DGA. We don't want to do worse than PD. Uh, here's a similar problem. It's the interstitial uh, energy, uh, formation energy in silicon. So we can add an extra silicon atom between the silicon atoms of the lattice, and it, it costs energy to push that atom in there, and how much? Well, uh, the diffusion Monte Carlo value is about five electron volts. The hybrid functional HSE, pretty good, right? In every case, these are just three different places where we can put the silicon atom. Uh, the um, LDA, too low, three and a half volts. PW91 and PV are better at four volts, but they're still not getting there. TPSS not getting there either. So, so let's see what happens when we go to scan. That's on the next slide. Uh, I'm showing two things here. The energy change per atom in the uh, phase transition and the transition pressure. And here I'm using now experimental experimental reference. The experimental transition pressure is 11 to 15 gigapascals. And these PPE getting about 8.4 low. Uh, if you use scan, you get 14.3. It's in the range. Uh, 
experiment. Uh, the energy change in the transition also is also much closer to the reference value. Um, similar, similar thing happens for the uh, interstitial defect formation energy. The PB, the, this, these are now experimental values and not, not diffusion Monte Carlo. The PB values are low. Scan values are better. Still not perfect, but, but much better. Mm -hmm. It's five minutes to do. Five minutes. Oh, okay, I've got a long way to go in five minutes. <laughs> oh, I'll do it faster. Uh, okay, these are these are water, uh, water hexamers, six water molecules bound into a, into a, a certain different structures, and, and there are four structures here that people commonly look at. Uh, the diffusion Monte Carlo result is probably right. The, the most bound structure is the prism, the largest binding energy. That agrees pretty well with couple of cluster. PBE predicted the most structure is the lowest structure. That's wrong. Uh, Scan predicts the right prism structure as the stable structure. Uh, it overbinds a bit. But the order and the energy differences between the different structures are pretty good. Okay. Uh, Janway also did ice phases, seven different crystal structures of ice. It can transform into one another under pressure. He got correct energy differences for all, all of those phases. Here's the new result for liquid water, which is not even written up yet. It's ab initio molecular dynamics, so, so we, uh, we have uh, the nuclei moving according to uh, Newton's law, and the force on the nucleus is the gradient of the ground state energy for a particular nuclear configuration. Uh, and we use scan to calculate that uh, ground state potential energy for different nuclear positions. Uh, it was done for a while, but PV over structures water. In fact, I went to a uh, a CCAM meeting that Kieran organized in Dublin about density motion years ago. There was an Irish speaker, Irish scientist, not Kieran, who, who pointed out that if PD were if the PD functional were right, the Titanic would not have sunk because the iceberg would have been on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> PD makes liquid water less dense than ice, and uh, the iceberg sinks. Uh, PB also overstructured water. You get two, uh, two organized, two solid like a structure in the liquid. Um, scan corrects both of those things. It gets, it gets the right, more or less the right densities for ice and water. And this is because scan is getting the Van der Waals interaction, the UV and Van der Waals interaction right as well as the as well as the hydrogen bond. Uh, water is pretty important in chemistry and biology. This is I think the first time that a density functional. It was shown that for because I think one of the functional effects are essential for the correct description. So typically these emissions go beyond one of the high because of emotion of the nuclei. So given that um Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well the the simulation was actually done uh, at a temperature of 30, degree, 30 degrees higher than the experimental temperature. That's, that extra temperature is supposed to simulate the, the uh, quantum motion of the nuclei. Uh, can, can you come back to the slide on the Yes, yes. So, so my collaborators who do this, Sheikh uh, Lamu, uh, uh, Roberto Carr, they can do those things, but they haven't done them yet. First time. Okay, um, we, we looked at ferroelectrics. So, fer uh, Freddie mentioned ferroelectrics. Huh? Does the water include the Van der Waals effects or not? It does include the Van der Waals. It includes the intermediate range Van der Waals interaction in SCAN. There's also a long range correction to that, which is not included in this calculation. So, it's not included in this calculation? The long range correction to SCAN is not included. How much that? Well, we haven't done it, so we don't know. <laughs> it's a good question, okay? The, the long-range correction is uh, to, to uh, scan is much weaker than the long-range correction to PVE, but how, how important it is, it's still a good question. 
Okay, ferroelectrics. Uh, these are materials uh, which uh, have a, a cubic structure and then they can distort into a non-cubic structure of the creation of permanent electric dipole moments. Very hard problem to, uh, to uh, compute with uh, functional. The PBE typically gives you too much ferroelectric distortion by a significant fraction of what they call super tetragonality. Uh, hybrid functionals are better, but still uh, still have some of that super uh, uh, that uh, super tetragonality. And and scan is actually much better. It gives you good uh, structural distortions. It gives you good ferroelectric polarizations from the very phase calculation. It gives you even good transition temperatures for the for the uh, high temperature destruction of ferroelectricity. Stability of crystal structures. Well, uh, we're working with Gary Cedar, uh, who's uh, who sort of uh, inspired the materials genome initiative in the U.S. Uh, and we found that SCAN essentially halves the error that PBE makes for the formation energies of solids. And because it does that, it also halves the error rate for the prediction of the lowest energy structure. PBE uh, prediction error, error rate in, in our data set is 25% for scan 12%. If you're interested in band gaps in solids, uh, and I know some, some of you are, uh, the PBE gaps, in, in, when implemented, if you implement a scan or even a hybrid functional in the OEP, you'll get essentially the same band gap as you get with the OEA or G scan. But if you implement these methods in the generalized cone shafts team that uh, uh, Lior talked about, then uh, the band gaps are much more realistic. Uh, in scan, the gap opens up uh, and gives you about 40% of the correction you need to the GTA gap. And a, a hybrid functional is much better for this, for the gap. So it gives you more like 100% of the correction for almost every solid you can imagine. Uh, there's a good reason for this. Uh, this. This also happens for the right reason. It's because when you implement, uh, when you calculate the band gap of the solid with, with, uh, with a, uh, in a, in a generalized cone sham scheme, you get the ground state energy difference I minus A that defines the fundamental, fundamental gap within the same approximation. That's, that's explained in this PNAS paper here. Okay, uh, non-local corrections. I, 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 sorry about that, I'm running out of time. Uh, there's a long-range Van der Waals correction to scan. Uh, it turns out to be important for some problems. It's crucially important for the exfoliation energy of a layered material. Without this long-range correction, you get the wrong answer. With the long-range correction, you get the right answer for 50 different layered materials. Uh, it also turns out to be surprisingly important for the surface energies and work functions of metals. You may not think that, but that's what we found. Maybe 10% of the surface energy comes from long range Van der Waals correction. Maybe 0.3 electron volts of the work function comes from Van der Waals. And, and finally, the, the, what, what we haven't done yet, but what we hope to do, is the, to implement the last remaining constraints which can, cannot be implemented in a semi-local functional, but require a fully non-local functional. The self-interaction correction, for instance, making the functional exact, even, in, even for the exchange energy of any one electron density. Maybe satisfying the piecewise linearity of the energy as a function of particle number, uh, or White House flat, flat plane condition. Uh, this is certainly needed for stretch bonds and probably for strong correlation. So I think I should stop there, and uh, maybe we have time for a question. Well, you're, you're, you're right in saying that the rule of high density and low density is calculated one constraint. I was wrong about this. I had the list here. Yeah, actually, two. Yeah, what I said about that was wrong because in, in my list here and in, in the paper we counted them as two separate. Let's say correlation. Yeah, yeah. I is one and, and low is two. That's right. Yeah. Months and months of work. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Deserves its own number. <laughs>
<laughs> but also, let me let me make another comment here about the difference between you know this wonderful way of, of using these traits and 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 this idea of committing to just empirical, right? Mm -hmm. But again, as you pointed out before, okay, you have you have computation numbers, exact numbers. so they are legitimate constraints, but they just for those there are just a few of them. But any one of these constraints you're using are infinite number, each one of them. Yes, yes. And, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a very important point. Yeah, yes. that's an important point. Yeah. So, and as you pointed out before, the unit for the uniform gas, that's an infinite number of densities. Right. Right. With all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the power of the constraint. Yeah. 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 So when you speak about self-induction reactions, is producing the self-induction reactions, yes? Mm -hmm. And when you apply the single flow functions, do you always obtain vice-wise linearity for energy with respect to number of Or you expect it, expect that it will be a scan function? Okay, that's a, <clears throat> that's a, that's a very good question. And, and uh, all, all I can tell you that I know about that <clears throat> is that uh, in, in the original work, uh, the Purdue Zunger work from 1981, we looked at the energy uh, as a function uh, of uh, electron number in an atom, fractional electron number in an atom, and we found that it was nearly linear. Uh, it's exactly linear for electron numbers between 0 and 1, and it's approximately linear between 1 and 2 or, or higher integers. And uh, that, that uh, observation was actually what led to the PPLV paper, because you know, at first it was a little surprising to us to see that coming out of an approximate, in this case an approximation led to an exact theory. That, that often happens. It's not, not so unusual. Uh, so I don't know how, it, first of all, we, we want to apply uh, the self-interaction direction to scan, which is different from applying it to PBE or LDA. I don't know if, if we will preserve this linearity and for how many systems we will preserve it. If we don't, then we need another method for enforcing linearity, but White House has a method to do that, the, the local scaling method, which I don't know when you talk about that, White House. No, okay. <laughs> okay, he won't talk about it. But anyway, that's, uh, it, it, it would be nice to get the linearity from the self-interaction correction without an, an additional construction. But I don't know for sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will again come back to the optical spectrum. Sure. So uh, with scan, was there anything uh, done for the optical spectrum? And if yes, uh, how is it performed? Because I would like to know about that. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> no, we haven't done uh, we haven't done anything for for optical spectrum. Uh, are, are you thinking of op optical spectrum from uh, from time dependent DFT or? Uh, mostly with Green's function. Green's function. Green's function. Yeah. Green's function. So, okay. Uh, no, we haven't done anything, okay. anything there. Uh, I think you know. Often the Green's functions are implemented on on the, uh, on some set of Cohn-Sham orbitals or generalized Cohn-Sham orbitals. So that could be done. Yeah. But I'm not sure. It would, I'm not sure how much would help. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that the scan can describe. Intermediate range follow of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions about this. First of all, how, how do you know this? Okay. Uh -huh. and identify. Right. This. Okay. Uh -huh. and second, um, which of the exact uh, features that the function satisfies is, is responsible for that? Yes. Okay. That's, 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 those are good questions. Uh, so so uh, so here here I, I want to start by giving some credit to Don Truard. Now, Don, Don constructs function, empirical functions with lots of parameters. It's not my favorite way of doing it, but uh, his his meta GDA the M O six L was probably the first semi-local functional that captured intermediate range Van der Waals interaction. The way you know that's happening is if you get uh, realistic uh, unlikely and unrealistic binding energies for, say, 
two argon atoms in, in an argon dimer or for two small molecules in the S22 set. So because the S22 set binding energies, these are, these are small molecules, closed shell molecules, so many of them only bind with, with, with the banner walls or, or some of them also have hydrogen bonds. But, but uh, if, you, if you get uh, good, uh, good air statistics from the S22 set, that's an indication uh, that you're capturing intermediate range banner walls. An intermediate range typically means just the equilibrium distance between one atom or molecule and another under the, under the van der Waals uh, traction. And then the other question is, how did we get the right, this is actually a very good question, it's one I didn't address. How do we get the right behavior for the functional at large alpha? When alpha is much bigger than one, that's, that's typical of the region between two closed shell objects uh, that are van der Waals bound at equilibrium. Intermediate range, of course, what it means is the densities have to have some overlap. The densities have no overlap, then the semi-local functional will not give you any interaction. So it has to be uh, overlap. And uh, and so so what, what what we did for that is we introduced a, 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 an appropriate norm, which was two argon atoms very strongly compressed, so that the the densities have extremely strong overlap. This is very far from an equilibrium. Uh, binding position of two argon atoms. We just push them together so they have a, a large region of overlap so that the large region of overlap would affect the energy. And then we simply fitted the, the energy at this large overlap. One, basically one, one large overlap we fitted there. And that determines the, the, the behavior of the functional at large alpha. Uh, any in context with um, where skin will be performed better or worse than the chemical shift or other sorts of corrections for uh, and loss forces? Uh, okay, uh, we don't have too many too many comparisons there. Um, I think there was I think there was I think there was one comparison in the in this uh, in my in my slides that maybe I can go back to. It was this one. Okay. So these are the water hexamers, and uh, this is uh, th this starts with PVE, and then it long it adds a long range Van der Waals correction from Chechenko and Shep. So PVE doesn't have any intermediate range, but so all of the intermediate and long range correction, the Van der Waals correction PVE is coming from this uh, Chechenko Scheffler, and that is uh, that is. Well, pretty good for the magnitudes of the interactions, but it actually gets the predicts the long uh, the long structure of lowest energy. So, so I, I would say that that's probably a pretty good way to correct PVE. The biggest error of PVE for many problems is in fact the missing van der Waals. Chenko Scheffler does this very well for many systems. Uh, we learned recently it doesn't work for ionic crystals unless you redefine way to do it. So, so is this a straightforward application that may get the wrong answer for an So this is a process for us. But it can be corrected for that too. Then in Kieran's next and then my thought. that the results for the barrier has and that there's only a small standard, right? So that's right. And you were asking me about the so, uh, I looked at part of the results, and they had done that around the same time we were doing And our data set of about 20 or so different reactions, or maybe about 40. The error with the B lip is 6.3 kilocalories per mole, the mean average error, and the hardly fast B lip result is 2.5. Oh, so it's uh -huh. more than a factor of two better. That's actually uh, one. Yeah, turn on this thing. Oh, it was he using heart? He was using heart rate densities. Heart rate density. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and see, and I don't know why that has results for linear scaling. So that has a bigger effect on the matter. Yeah. So we know, you know, we have to be 
this in any event, brains can long work. Are you saying that if we have two kinds of physics, or um, it's a little bit harder that you can get it with a single or functional, with good interaction energy, mm -hmm. and this interaction uh, meaning. Yes. But then you cross, you really lack the body. Right. Uh -huh. So, so are they coming from different figures? Well, I think, it, you know, it's, I mean, one way to look at it is that um, it, it's all part of the exchange correlation energy. Right? <laughs> and at long range, you know, at a large separation between two objects when there's no, uh, when there's no density overlaps, you really need a, a, a non-local functional that can recognize that situation and give you an interaction through empty space between one object and another. Uh, and at short range, uh, it, it, you know, when you really push two objects together to make a united atom in that extreme limit, you can use the semi-local functional. So there's some kind of transition between the, re the, between the, the, the separation, the, the large separations where the semi-local functional gives you zero uh, van der Waals and the very short uh, range separation where it gives you the right interaction between the two objects. And that's the sort of intermediate range of the world region. So, so the way these long range corrections work, it, it, at least the one we used uh, is, is revised Vidra von Voorhees 2010, RVV10. And it, uh, it has a, a, a cutoff parameter which determines how long the long range is? How long a range is long range for the correction? And you can tune that parameter so that the parameter for PBE will be it will be a much shorter separation, a much shorter distance than for uh, scan. But but basically they, they merge together smoothly. We can plot out the you know, we can plot out the Van der Waals interaction, and you get a perfectly smooth and natural variation from the intermediate range to the we did that, for instance, for uh, uh, graphene on nickel. If you any comment on this point, uh, based on our experience with M06, sure. so there we saw something very similar to what you just said. So working with uh, therapy, we saw that for something like the S22 set, indeed the M06 set performs substantially better than, say, PPE. However, still, because it's not the same level of correct, it still benefits from, say, the chunk structure of corrections. But the damping function is indeed pushed further up. So it covers, a, you know, an extra piece of the middle yes. range, mm -hmm. but doesn't go all the way up to the long range, so we still benefit from extra corrections. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing here. Uh, that's, that's interesting, Mark, because I, I think I've heard uh, Don say that don't add, a, don't add a long range correction to this functional because it's got <laughs> All the manner rolls it needs. But but at, at long range there must be a correction. Right. right. And the yeah. reason we have shown that quantitative there is yeah. Okay, I'd like to see that. Yeah. I have just one maybe a small comment to this slide that is short sure. question. Uh, if we can put the open energy, the order of the most stable structure changes. And experimentally the most popular structure is the cage one. Uh, have you tried to include it? Uh, no, I don't think the zero point motion is included here. That's, a, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure that here we're comparing with the fusion of Monte Carlo, so I think it's all static nuclei. Yes, that's why I'm asking because that's quite interesting that covering the zero the change of the strength. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's yeah. Sometimes a very small energy difference can yes, make a big qualitative yes, effect. Yeah. That will lead to a yeah, That's right. Another example about a superconductivity where a very small energy difference completely changes the character. Uh, I just want to say one comment about the separation of the nanograms. So one summer, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I spent with Walter, and we actually worked on this problem. And he had worked on it for 50 years. And we didn't publish everything that we did. But one of the things I sort of came to understand was that he felt there was something 
I wouldn't say very wrong, but some things were very missing from the standard chemistry way of thinking about the van der Waals and, and getting this asymptotic expansion uh, in powers of R for the reasons that we've heard, where everything is coming close together, you must stand them and so forth. And he had a way of looking at it within time dependent DFT, looking at fluctuations where through the real time calculation, you would naturally get an expansion that's contained, gives you all this, but does not uh, diverge as, as R gets small. And and the reason that R expansion is sort of wrong is it's an asymptotic expansion, uh, and it's based on this idea of the non-overlapping densities. But you can never have non-overlapping densities. The density function theory by construction, right? Always density everywhere. And so he had a strong sense that this way of approaching it, I mean, while the thing that people have done is correct, is not the correct physical way of thinking about this problem. And one way he would put it is that he wanted to know what the small parameter was that made Van der Waals energy so small. And he'd been thinking about it for 50 years, but he hadn't found it. Yeah, and of course, obviously, we were going to start writing it, it was never finished. Uh, but that was, that was, that was, that was, he thought there would, there, there would be a theoretical construction other than RPA-like that would, would go seamlessly from absolutely. small separation to yes. large separation. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, you end up with things that are very similar to RPA, but his work, one of the earliest things is that there's a set of lecture notes from the huge 1968 where he's looking at uh, two metal surfaces. And but all the physics is, is very much the same. The powers come out different, but the way they come out of it is the same. But, but the, the most recent things that we were working on, they're not in any of the yeah. notes yeah. anywhere. The Van der Waals interaction, I think, you know, a lot of work has been done on it in the past 50 years of the grand set. And, and, and I, I think it's only only now that we're starting to realize how how important it is for many problems, right? So, so I think Van der Waals the Van der Waals interaction is important for the relative stabilities of many different crystal structures. Uh, it's uh, it's important for the lattice constants of the metals, <laughs> you know. In, 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 in one way of looking at the errors of PV is to say most of what's missing is Van der Waals. Um, come on, I'd love to say. So, um, of course, the dynamics are always in this construction of kind of all interactions in the wrong way. As I can imagine, there's no open. So, imagine there's a wall, as well as I put it, and I just see the energy of the problems. But the color interactions against the fluctuations are not good. Now, if one tries to describe this kind of situation, so very long with the wall, actually, for this situation, DFT and the one back home theorem is not bad. Now, the people want. Now, this is color, exactly. So then, does that mean that it's hopeless? No. In <laughs> <laughs> the long range, and hence also a seamless. That's what we're that, that's, that's 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 that's